Last time, we plunged into the book of Isaiah, but in particular, really focused upon the first verse. That is, the verse that introduces us to the time period, the context of the prophecies of Isaiah. And, of course, inevitably, what we need to stress in considering this time period is the kind of tension that we discussed last time. That on the one hand, in order to understand the words of the prophets, we need to bear in mind the context. When and under what circumstances they were uttering these words. But of course, simultaneously, the real reason we're studying these words is, of course, not to know what was, but as guidance for what is, as guidance for our lives, with the premise that although, as we discussed, we distinguish the words of the prophets from the words of the Torah, the five books of Moses, the words of the prophets are time-bounded and addressing the particular circumstances of the prophet's life in a way that the eternal instruction of the Torah does not. At the same time, these words of the prophets come to us because they continue not only to inspire but to guide us for all generations in how we are to live our lives. So again, there's a tension here. The tension between, on the one hand, needing to understand the context of the prophet's words, and on the other hand, specifically by doing so, to understand how the prophet's words speak to us. So, with that, let's first consider what the prophet's words are here. I'd like to, at the very least, get some kind of a sense of how the book of Isaiah begins. Obviously, the opening prophecy of the book is necessarily of crucial import in our understanding not only this prophecy, but the whole book and the whole career of Isaiah, and then to consider the context, the circumstances. We spoke of the reigns of the four kings listed in the opening verse. Uzziah, Yotam, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, Hizkiahu. And inevitably we'll need to return to their reigns in this understanding the context of these words. But again, first the words, beginning in verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for God has spoken. Children I have reared and brought up, and they have rebelled against me. Verse 3. The ox knows its owner. The ass his master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people does not consider. And verse 4, more directly. Ah, sinful nation. A people laden with iniquity. A seed of evildoers, children, that deal corruptly. They have forsaken the Lord. They have condemned the Holy One of Israel. They are turned away backward. And what follows after these three opening verses of condemnation is a bemoaning of the consequent fate of the nation, the punishments, the destruction, the desolation that have come about because of these sins. Verse 5, on what part will you yet be stricken, 
seeing you stray away more and more. Every head is sick and every heart faint. And it's the entire body of the nation, verse 6, from the sole of the foot even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and festering sores. They have not been pressed, neither bound up, neither mollified with oil. Verse 7, moving from the analogy to the ailing person to the obvious analog, the nation. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers, devour it in your presence. And it is desolate as you're overthrown by floods. Or perhaps a better translation, as that turned over to strangers. Say, the daughter of Zion is left as a booth in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Indeed, verse 9, except the God of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant. We should have been at Sodom. We should have been like unto Gomorrah. Complete devastation. So these opening verses present to us an indictment and a description of a ruined nation, a desolate land, utter devastation. Now, there's an additional dimension that we should also note. And this we could describe as an additional component of the opening prophecy after the introductory words in verse 10 that revert, as it were, to the reference to Sodom and Gomorrah in verse 9. We read from verses 11 through 14 a very specific indictment, an indictment of everything that has to do with the service of God in the Holy Temple. Verse 11, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, says God? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he-goats. Verse 12, when you come to appear before me, who has requested this of you to trample my courts? Courts, of course, of the holy temple. Verse 13, bring no more vain oblations. It is an offering of abomination unto me. New moon and Sabbath, the holdings of convocations, all of the special times that were reflected in the special services in the holy temple. I cannot endure iniquity along with the solemn assembly. Verse 14, your new moons and your appointed seasons, my soul hates. They are a burden unto me. I am weary to bear them. And the consequence. Verse 15, and when you spread forth your hands, that is, you lift up your hands in prayer, because, after all, while we associate the Holy Temple with the service, principally the sacrificial service that took place in it, it's significant to note, and we've pointed this out in the past, that in King Solomon's prayer of dedication of the Holy Temple, in the first book of Kings, chapter 8, he doesn't say anything about the temple service per se, at all. He speaks exclusively of employing the temple as the conduit, the direction of our prayers. So the prayer then is, if anything, the culmination, the ultimate purpose of what we do in the temple, or even when we're outside of the temple, via the temple. When you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Why? 
And here we get to the crucial culmination of the indictment. In Hebrew, it's just three words. Translated here in English, a six, your hands are full of blood. That's the culmination of the indictment. What follows then is the summons to repentance. We'll get back to that. What I'd like to focus upon at the outset is the mystery. The mystery that really can't be resolved through a direct appeal to the text here. What's the context? of this prophecy of rebuke. Again, we recall there are these four kings, Uzziah, Yotam, Ahaz, and Chizkiah, Hezekiah, and the prophet Isaiah's career spans the four. Can we attempt to discern by the historical circumstances what was the time frame and of course most importantly to us what were the circumstances that occasioned these words of rebuke well to answer this question of course we'll need to bear in mind what we've already seen about these four kings and the generations over which they presided. And while we aren't going to be able to come to a clear, definitive, totally unambiguous answer to the question of which reign, which time frame occasioned these words of review, I think this exercise is an important one. It's an important one, first and foremost, because, as we will see presently, there really is a very obvious answer to the question. To the question, whose reign, what time frame occasioned these words of review? But there's a caveat, because, as is often the case with obvious answers, the obvious answer here is almost assuredly completely wrong. So, without any further ado, let's review the evidence and try to figure out what were the circumstances that elicited these words of rebuke. Because by solving this riddle to the best of our ability, we may be in a much better position to evaluate what circumstances in our own day and age are worthy of the same words of rebuke. So, we begin our overview once again, and I hope this material is familiar from last time with the first of these four kings king uziahu known principally in the second book of kings chapter 15 as azariah we noted already that azariah and uziah are essentially similar names given the etymologies of the two names Azariah in the Book of Kings, as is the same king by the name of Uziah in the Second Book of Chronicles, in chapter 26, described as doing what was upright in the eyes of God. The self-same expression in both instances. So, of course, on the one hand, that would seem to militate strongly against regarding anything in the words of rebuke that we just read in Isaiah as relevant to what's taking place during this king's reign. 
except, as you may recall, things are by no means perfect. That is, as expressed in verse 4 in the second book of Kings, chapter 15, albeit the high places were not taken away, the people still sacrificed and offered in the high places. As we noted, this was not idolatry. It wasn't paganism per se. It was, rather, worship of God in a forbidden manner that emulated the ways pagans worshipped their gods. It was a sin, even if it wasn't idolatry. Things were certainly not perfect. And moreover, there was an additional dimension in the passage in the book of Kings in verse 5 described very briefly as God having smitten the king with sarat, generally translated as leprosy, in the corresponding passage in the second book of Chronicles, chapter 26, there was a far more detailed description of the circumstances that led to the king being smitten, the trespass, going into the sanctuary in the Holy Temple, to offer incense upon the incense altar, something that was forbidden to anyone who was not one of the priests. And it was by consequence that Uzziah was smitten with Tarat, smitten with this plague from which he suffered for the rest of his life. So, words of rebuke. Well, On the one hand, both the people who are serving God, but serving God in an inappropriate manner, and the king, who also entered the temple in order to serve God, but in an inappropriate manner, warrant rebuke. Maybe, could be, the words of the prophet are directed at the generation of Uziah. The problem with this association is that you may recall before we get to verse 16, again in chapter 26 of the second book of Chronicles, where Uziah's heart is lifted up so that he did corruptly, we read a very detailed description of the extraordinarily successful exploits of King Guziao. The military exploits, the commercial exploits. On manifold planes, it was a very successful period for the nation. So speaking about a land that is in a state of abject desolation really doesn't chime that well with the reign of Uziel. That's the first of the four generations that we need to consider here. We continue with the second. Regarding the second, we read of the reign of Yotham in the second book of Kings, also chapter 15, at the end of the chapter. And here, once again, like his father, we read that the king did that which was upright in the eyes of God. And indeed, in the second book of Chronicles, chapter 27, we see the self-same statement. So that, on the one hand, we certainly are speaking of the reign of a righteous king, and yet, as we noted, where we read of the king's righteousness, in Chronicles, the continuation of the verse, that is chapter 27, verse 2, speaks of the king not entering into the temple of God without explaining what the circumstances that underlay that statement were, whether it was emphasizing that, unlike his father, he didn't trespass the bounds that were limited exclusively for the priests to bring incense in the sanctuary, or they avoided the temple altogether. In any case, there was an additional dimension 
at the end of verse 2, the people did yet corruptly in the book of Kings, chapter 15, in verse 35, we read yet again that the high places were not taken away, the people still sacrificed and offered in the high places. In other words, a forbidden way of serving God. So, are we dealing with a righteous king and a righteous generation? Inevitably, again, the answer must be yes, but what about the description of desolation and destruction? Well, on the one hand, in the second book of Chronicles, in the aforementioned description in chapter 27, verse 5, and in verse 6, we read about Yotam's successes. In verse 5, he fought also with the king of the children of Ammon and prevailed against them. In verse 6, Yotam became mighty because he ordered his ways before God his Lord. And yet, going back to the second of Kings, chapter 15, verse 37 tells us, in those days, God began to send against Judah, Ritzin, the king of Aram, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, the king of Israel. So, obviously this was not a period of uninterrupted calm. Does it match the description of desolation that we read in the first chapter of Isaiah? We can't tell for sure. But, arguably, things are less stable, less calm in the reign of Yatam than in the reign of his father, Uziah. So when we consider the following generation, that is, Yatam's son, Ahaz, we realize we're dealing with a whole different order of magnitude. Ahaz is explicitly described both in the second book of Kings, chapter 16, verse 2, and in the second book of Chronicles, chapter 28, verse 1, as doing not what was upright in the eyes of God, and indeed in the description in the second book of Kings, we read about his walking in the ways of the kings of Israel, which implies idolatry in Chronicles. It's not really implied. It's stated explicitly. He walked in the ways of the kings of Israel and made also molten images for the Baalim, the pagan deities of the indigenous nations. And he offered in the valley of the son of Hinnom and burnt his children in the fire according to the abominations of the heathens, of the nations whom God cast out before the children of Israel. Here we're really talking about an evil king, a bankrupt generation. A suitable object for the prophecies of rebuke an indictment of Isaiah, obviously. And furthermore, with respect to the question of destruction, desolation, well, in both the Book of Kings and the Book of Chronicles, we get clear answers. In Second Book of Kings, chapter 16, in verse 5, we read that Ritzin, the king of Aram, and Pekah, the son of Ramoyah, king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to war. They besieged Ahaz, but could not overcome him. Well, they couldn't overcome him, but laying siege to the capital city obviously means devastation of the land. And furthermore, in verse 6, Ritzin, king of Aram, recovered Elat to Aram and drove the Jews from Elat. And the Edomites came to Elat and dwelt there unto this day, that is, Water skirmishes, the boundaries of the state of Judah are being constricted. They are under attack 
And in the Book of Chronicles, in far, far more devastating terms, we read in Second Book of Chronicles, chapter 28, from verse 5 through verse 8, the devastation that takes place. Wherefore, God, his Lord, delivered him into the hand of the king of Aram, and they smote him, and carried away of his a great multitude of captives, and brought them to Damascus. And he was also delivered into the hand of the king of Israel, who smote him with a great slaughter. Verse 6, For Pekach, the son of Amalias, slew in Judah 120,000 in one day, all them valiant men, because they had forsaken God, the God of their fathers. And there's also a description in verse 8 of 200,000 women and children being taken away as captives and brought to Samaria as war spoil. So certainly, they're speaking of a period of terrible devastation. And obviously, to that extent, this is the obvious object of Isaiah's words. Is it not? Just to complete the picture, if anything, when we consider the fourth generation, this should be most obviously on a completely different plane. That is, when we read of the righteous King Hezekiah, King Chizkiyahu, the son of Akaz, in the second book of Kings, chapter 18, verse 3, he did that which was upright in the eyes of God according to all that David his father had done. Indeed, we see the self-same description in the book of Chronicles as well. This is a righteous king who indeed abolishes not only the vulgarities of idolatry, but even the inappropriate ways of serving God. We read of how in verse 5 he trusted in God, the God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor among them that were before him. Verse 6, for he cleaved to God, he departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which God commanded Moses. And besides the righteousness, also the prosperity. So it seems, we continue in the description in the second book of Kings, in verse 7, and God was with him, whithersoever he went forth he prospered. Verse 8, he spoke the Philistines unto Gaza, and the borders thereof, from the Tower of the Watchmen to the fortified city. And again, I reiterate that we find a similar description in the book of Chronicles, in the second book of Chronicles, in chapter 29. Again, in the same terms, he did what was upright in the eyes of God, according to all that David his father had done. Except, as I already warned at the outset, obvious answers are often incorrect ones. The truth of the matter is, as I already admitted, we aren't going to be able to establish unequivocally which generation was the direct object of Isaiah's words of rebuke in chapter 1. However, I think when we focus upon what's taking place in this chapter in Chronicles, again, the second book of Chronicles, chapter 29, we can, at the very least, exclude one of these four generations from being the object of Isaiah's words of rebuke. In the continuation of the description of King Ezekiel's campaign of religious revival, in verse 4, 
He brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them together in the broad place on the east and said to them, Hear me, Levites, now sanctify yourselves and sanctify the house of God, the God of your fathers, and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. And he continues, and this is critical. For our fathers have acted treacherously, he says in verse 6, and done that which was evil in the sight of God our Lord, and have forsaken him, and have turned away their faces from the habitation of God, and turned their backs. Verse 7, also they have shut up the doors of the porch, and put out the lamps, and have not burned incense, nor offered burnt offerings in the holy place unto the God of Israel. Pardon me, but who are the fathers to whom King Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, refers in verse 6 as having acted treacherously? Here, the answer really is obvious, and correctly so. He's speaking of his own father and his father's contemporaries. This is what took place during the reign of Ahaz. But wait. Note what happened then during the reign of Ahaz. They turned away their faces from the habitation of God. They turned their backs. Again, in verse 7, they shut up the doors of the porch, meaning they shut down the holy temple. They put up the lamps. They didn't burn incense, nor offered burnt offerings in the holy place unto the God of Israel. Recall Isaiah's indictment of a generation that was coming into the temple, that was burning incense, that was, as the prophet expressed it, trampling the courts of the temple with their undesired presence. It wasn't the generation that had forsaken the temple service. On the contrary, it was a generation that undoubtedly regarded itself as doing everything it was supposed to do because they were following all of the formal rules. It could have possibly been the generation of Ahaz. The generation of Ahaz, they weren't going to the temple at all. So, of course, then, our obvious answer, that the prophet directs himself to Ahaz and his contemporaries, is obviously wrong. We still don't know which of the other three kings and their corresponding generations would have been the object of this prophecy of rebuke by Isaiah. But, you know, if anything, it sure seems that the most likely target is the one that, at the outset, we might have thought was least likely. The generation of the righteous king, Hezekiah. After all, they refurbished the temple. They did everything that they were supposed to be doing. Remember here in the description in the Chronicles, verse 3, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of God. He had to open the doors. After all, everything had been shut closed during the reign of his father and repaired, reinforced them. Everything seems so right and is intact. So wrong. We really don't have to go very far to appreciate the glaring correspondence. In King Ezekiel's words to the priests and the Levites, 
he uses expressions that are so obviously evocative of Isaiah's rebuke, it could hardly be coincidental. In verse 8, Wherefore the wrath of God was upon Judah and Jerusalem, and he has delivered them to be a horror and astonishment and a hissing, as you see with your eyes. Well, of course, he's speaking of the devastations that took place during the reign of his father. But it's not like Judah recovered from them, certainly not in any immediate way. For lo, our fathers have fallen by the sword. Remember, 120,000 in a single day. And our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. Remember, the 200,000 women and children taken captive? Judah is in a state of devastation. And everyone's thinking, why are we in such a state of devastation? What we're doing is exactly what we're supposed to be doing. We're so righteous. We're so good. What could we possibly be doing differently? We're coming into the temple, bringing all the offerings, raising our hands in prayer, those hands. That is the indictment of the prophet. A full model. King Hezekiah understood. In verse 10, now it is in my heart to make a covenant with God, the God of Israel, that his fierce anger may turn away from us. He understood that even he may be not entirely. Because, as we noted in the second book of Chronicles, chapter 32, in verse 24, we read of the sickness of King Hezekiah, it's sickness about which we read in the book of Kings and the book of Isaiah as well, that he prayed to God, he spoke unto him, God spoke to the king and gave him a sign, but here in the second book of Chronicles, chapter 32, verse 25, that Hezekiah rendered not according to the benefit done unto him, for his heart was lifted up, therefore there was wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem. Now, it's true that in verse 26, we read, notwithstanding, Zechariah humbled himself to the pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of God came not upon them in the days of Zechariah. But, we still need to consider this reprieve, that the wrath of God came not upon them in the days of Zechariah, in light of the previous verse that told us, there was wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem. Remember, the siege of Sancherib, Sennacherib. When the Assyrian Empire's army encamps round about the walls of Jerusalem, it has, for all intents and purposes, already conquered the rest of the land of Judah. True, as intimated in verse 26, there was a final reprieve. Jerusalem was spared, and 185,000 soldiers of the Assyrian Empire were smitten by the angel of God in a single night, so that the siege ultimately went nowhere. But that doesn't mean there wasn't any devastation. This was a period. It was indeed filled with devastation. A period that was the most challenging since the establishment of the monarchy in Israel. Remember, this is also the period when the ten tribes were exiled by the Assyrian Empire. So, to venture an answer to our opening question. What is the context of this opening chapter of Isaiah? It's important for us to stress. And upon reflection, it really is obvious. It's not a period of 
rampant bankruptcy. It's not a period when people had in any overt way turned their backs upon God or turned their backs on the Holy Temple. On the contrary, it's a period in which people think we're doing fun. It's on a social plane. On a moral and ethical plane. In the way they relate to one another. But the prophet, sent by God, discerns a deeply rooted bankruptcy. A rut on the inside. It's not something that is transparently obvious. Like in the previous generation of Achaz, when he just shut down the temple and no one was going to engage in any sort of divine service at all. This is more subtle and therefore more dangerous. The words of the prophet are directed at every generation, like ours, where people think that they're just fine, they're doing everything they need to do with God. They're not turning their backs on the temple. No. They're turning their backs on their fellow human beings. This is the way the book of Isaiah begins. And there's an additional dimension that I feel compelled to stress here. Well, we know this last time as well, and that is what makes this beginning of the book of Isaiah all the more significant is, while we really don't know for sure in what period of the prophet's life, the prophet's prophetic career, these words were expressed, what we do know with a fair degree of certainty is, chapter 1 is not Isaiah's first prophecy. After all, the first prophecy, most obviously, is where the prophet tells us, I heard the voice of God saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. But that's not chapter 1, that's chapter 6, verse 8. That indeed is a prophecy that begins with a very explicit time frame in the year that King Uzziah died. We're still going to need to consider what that time frame means exactly. We've discussed it in other contexts as well. But for all appearances, Isaiah's inaugural prophecy is in chapter 6. The first prophecy in the book of Isaiah is not the inaugural prophecy. It's specifically these words of rebuke. Now, inevitably, we need to consider why this needs to be the opening prophecy of the book. One point that should certainly be stressed is on manifold planes, we find many expressions in the opening chapter of Isaiah that seem transparently to be a reflection of, a resonance with the song of Moses at the end of the Torah in Deuteronomy chapter 32. For lack of time, we're not going to go through the various examples one by one. You can consider them in detail on the source sheet, that is, all the expressions are as in our usual format, boxed in the English and in a colored font in the Hebrew. So we can certainly find many expressions that indeed provide a correspondence between the opening chapter of Isaiah and Deuteronomy chapter 32. But that doesn't answer the question, does it? After all, why should that be the determinant of how the book of Isaiah begins? One approach that is 
articulated by some scholars is that this does help to establish the bond, the connection between the words of the prophet and the words of the Torah. And indeed, as we have noted in this regard, it is, of course, of critical importance for us to always bear in mind that the role of the prophets is essentially to be a reinforcement for the words of the Torah. And as we've noted in this regard, it is by no means inconsequential that the last of the prophets in the Hebrew Bible, Malachi, in chapter 3, verse 22, in his final words, the final words of the Hebrew prophets, bids the reader, bids his audience, Zichru Torah Moshe Avi, remember the Torah of Master Moses. So the connection, of course, between the words of Moses and the words of Isaiah is an appropriate one. It still doesn't answer the question. I think there's an additional dimension that we should bear in mind. And it pertains to something that we have considered in our studies of the Torah, the five books of Moses, focusing upon Deuteronomy chapter 32. What's the critical message that is emergent from the Song of Moses? More important than anything else, personally, I think the most important message that is emergent from that song, we discussed this previously, is it teaches us the critical importance of history. Not to view history as merely something cyclical that reverts to its beginning over and over again. Rather, something linear, something moving inexorably toward the future. And because it is moving toward the future, and because it summons of us to do our jobs as God charges us in advancing the world toward the future, it makes every stage in the progression, every step along this line, significant. We're not going in circles. We're going forward. And the deeds that we do will play a critical role in how we go forward. That was the message, perhaps the most critical message of Deuteronomy chapter 32. And in this vein, there is a particular nuance that I feel compelled to emphasize, because I think it's especially relevant. It appears in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 30, and it appears on a number of additional instances in Scripture. The English doesn't really suffice here, so I call your attention to the Hebrew, the word Eicha. On the one hand, Eicha is a poetic construction of the Hebrew Eich, which is simply the interrogative meaning how. But the poetic construction is not merely poetry. Implicit in it, and we can see this in particular, where the word Echa appears at the beginning of the verse. It represents a plaintive cry. That's why I inserted in brackets not only the word how, but also the word oh, oh, how. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, we first encounter this construction. The first place that Echa appears at the beginning of a verse 
in chapter 1, verse 12, Oh, how can I myself alone bear your cumbrance and your burden and your strife? Says Moses. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 30, Oh, how should one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight except their wrath had given them over and God had given them up? It's all a matter of divine providence. And not only then, in Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 8, Oh, how do you say we are wise? And the Torah of God is with us. Lo, certainly in falsehood has wrought the false pen of the scribes. A plaintive cry, an indictment by our tradition. The prophet Jeremiah, besides writing the book of Jeremiah, also authored the book of Lamentations. And the book of Lamentations, which in common parlance in Hebrew, we identify as Eicha. Because of its opening word, we find Eicha appearing four times, three of which are at the beginning of chapters of the book. The first chapter, oh, how does the city sit solitary that was full of people? The second chapter, oh, how has God covered with a cloud the daughter of Zion in his anger? In the fourth chapter, oh, how is the gold become dim? How is the most fine gold changed? The hallowed stones are poured out at the head of every street. The plaintive cry is, in a very deep sense, connected to what we said of the significance of every step in history. It's important for us to recall that in Isaiah chapter 1, in verse 21, we also encounter, oh, how. One of the many motifs in Deuteronomy chapter 32 that appear in Isaiah chapter 1. And here it is, oh, how is the faithful city become a harlot? She that was full of justice, righteousness, lodged in her, but now murderers. The significance of each of these thresholds in history, each, a ha, oh, how, is to appreciate the importance of history, the importance of what we are doing. Don't think for a moment that your actions are insignificant. Certainly don't think, oh, well, as long as I've gotten my life in order because I've kept everything that I need to do with the temple service, I'm set, I'm done, I'm complete, I'm righteous. Oh, how, oh, how is the faithful city become a harlot? Faithfulness that really is merely faithlessness in disguise. That's the real challenge of the first chapter of Isaiah. And until we integrate the message of Deuteronomy chapter 32 and appreciate the historic significance of what we do because history has significance, we won't really integrate into our lives this summons of God. Because in essence, after all, it's God who is saying, oh, how? How did you let this happen to you? Look at you. Where are you? I can't help but note that the Hebrew, Eicha, is the self-same spelling, albeit with different vowels and different pronunciation, of another word, a word that appears 
in Genesis chapter 3, immediately after the sin of Adam and Eve, when following the sin, God, so to speak, is described as going through the garden and challenging Adam. In Hebrew, in chapter 3, verse 9, it is Ayeka. Ayeka literally means, where are you? Again, same letters as Echa. Because in some sense, what's God saying to Adam? He isn't asking where he is. He's saying to Adam, look at you. Where are you? Where were you before? Where are you now? And this continues to be the summons of the prophets, Moses, of Isaiah, of Jeremiah. Where are you? Oh, how? Because it's precisely about recognizing the significance of what you do, the significance of the decisions you make. Don't think, oh, I can do whatever I want outside. I'll go into the temple and everything will be fine. Because your relationship with God is predicated upon what are you doing as a human being. And with that realization, I feel compelled to, at the very least, briefly note that corresponding to the words of Isaiah that we saw in verses 11, 12, 13, and 14, which amounted to, who needs your temple service, are words that we find repeated by the prophets over and over again. In Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 20, in Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 21 and 22, in Hosea chapter 8, verse 13, in Amos chapter 5, verses 21 through 25, and perhaps most famously, best known, in the words of the prophet Micha in chapter 6. We find the expression also in Malachi in chapter 1, verse 10. But just to recall briefly the words of Micha, when people say, Wherewith shall I come before God and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will God be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? And says the prophet, it has been told you, O oh man, what is good and what God requires of you, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And of course, in much the same vein, what, after all, is the prophet Isaiah saying, in God's name, after the indictment of the temple service that God can't tolerate? I'm not looking for your temple offerings. When you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. When you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. What you need to do, in fact, is, verse 16, wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Verse 17, learn to do well. Seek justice. Relieve the oppressed. Judge for the fatherless. Plead for the widow. That's what I'm asking of you. So, what indeed, then, does the prophet mean by all of this? Is the prophet 
casting aspersions on the laws of the temple service, laws, after all, that are given by God in the words of Moses in the Torah, is that the thrust of it? Inevitably, it's important for us to appreciate the answer is certainly no. And we'll merely note briefly, were we to think that the prophet Isaiah regards the temple service as something negative, as something to be spurned, as something to be disbanded, we certainly wouldn't expect that in Isaiah chapter 56, when the prophet speaks of the reward of the aliens in verse 6, who join themselves to God to minister unto him and to love the name of God to be his servants. But he says in verse 7, even then will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my heart, house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable upon my altar, for my house will be called the house of prayer for all peoples. Note that vision of the everlasting reward of the aliens who join themselves to God is that their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable upon my altar. The prophet is certainly not advocating disbanding the temple and eliminating the temple service, nor, of course, could he possibly. After all, as expressed in Numbers chapter 23, verse 19, and these are, of course, the words of Bil'am, not even coming from within Israel, but their words are certainly true. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Similarly, the words of the prophet Samuel expressed to King Saul in the first book of Samuel, chapter 15, verse 29, the glory of Israel, God will not lie nor repent. And indeed, in the words of Moses in Deuteronomy, chapter 29, verse 28, the hidden things belong to God our Lord, but the things that are revealed belong to us and our children forever, that we may do all the words of this Torah. So clearly then, the laws of the Torah remain from the perspective of the prophet, eternal and eternally applicable. What's the message with respect to the temple service? I'll respond on two planes. I think they're both true. They certainly are both to be found in our tradition. One is the obvious. The obvious is, if you think of the temple service as the way you relate to your theology, your service of God, and the way you relate to the orphan and the widow, again, in the words of Micha, you're doing justly and loving mercy and walking humbly with your God as the deeds that you do. If the deeds are corrupt, the godly theology doesn't redeem you. If anything, on the contrary, the godly theology makes it worse. It makes what you're doing all the more repulsive. Because if people perceive you as a man of God, as allied with God's service, and you behave in a despicable manner, besides the odiousness, the enormity of the sins themselves, you're also profaning God's name by casting yourself, so to speak, as his emissary, 
being supposedly a man of God and behaving so despicably. So to that extent, what the prophets, all the prophets, have to say on the subject is, if this is the way you're behaving, get out of the temple. We don't need people who are godly in this sense, because they're really the worst sort of godlessness. The godlessness that masquerades behind the godly theology. The godlessness of coming into the temple because you think that if you come into the temple, everything will be fine. Nothing will be fine. Just because you come into the temple and then go outside and perform all of these abominations despite you having been in the temple. That is, in much of the same vein, again, I'm going to remind you of the words of Jeremiah speaking of the people who are bringing the offerings into the temple. And Jeremiah says, just take your sacrifices and eat them. You want to have a barbecue, have your barbecue. Just don't come into the temple and do it. The most insidious godlessness is the godlessness that masquerades as godliness by coming into the temple. So, of course, on that plane, the indictment of all the prophets, not because they're derogating the temple service. And again, Isaiah regards the temple service as part of his exalted vision of the future. But you have to be worthy of the temple service. That's one aspect. The additional aspect, which undoubtedly relates to this first aspect, is the realization that in engaging in the temple service, what you're striving to do is to make yourself godly. To engage in an intimate bond with the divine. Which is wonderful, except you have to be human before you can be godly. And again, returning to the words of Micha, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God, what the prophet in effect is saying is, you're trying to be godly? You're not even a person. If you're not doing this, doing justly, loving mercy, walking humbly with God, you haven't even met the baseline threshold of being human. Forget about godly. Undoubtedly, the highest level to which to aspire is to be godly, to transcend merely being human. You can't transcend merely being human if you aren't even human. So the first step is to become human. Only once you are a human being by your actions can you strive to be a godly being by transcending merely that level of humanity with a divine service, with a theological level, with the godliness of going into the temple. And that, then, is the message of Isaiah. True to form. So exquisitely consistent with what we saw throughout. That is, that what Isaiah is communicating to his generation and to ours and to all generations is this is the path to godliness. Not by transcending this world and forgetting about being a decent human being. You can't become godly if you aren't yet human. And that is why, then, the words of the prophet aren't intended merely as an indictment, but besides the rebuke, the remedy. Wash! Make you clean! Your hands are full of blood! Do something! The path is never blocked to repentance. But you're not going to get there until you recognize you have a problem. The worst tragedy is when people think, I'm fine. I'm doing everything I need to be doing. What could possibly be wrong? I'm going into the temple. I'm bringing all the offerings. You know, in the 
12-step approach to dealing with addictions, to alcohol, to drugs, to gambling, to all manner of social evil. The first step is to recognize you have a problem. The prophet tells us, we have a problem. We need to right the wrongs. We need to get our act together. We're not going to get there by playing being godly, playing being a saint, playing we're coming into the temple and doing everything we need to be doing and everything is fine. Wash, clean. And what does that mean in practice? Seek justice. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead to the widow. Do what you need to do to right the wrongs. Because then, indeed, God promises in verse 18, though your sins be as scarlet, the scarlet of the blood with which your hands are full, they will be as white as snow. You can do it. You can cleanse yourselves. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. It's up to you. If you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured with the sword. This indeed is the message of the first chapter of the It's all in our hands. Because that's precisely the way God has charged us. Ultimately, when we rise to that challenge, we know this is indeed God's mandate and God's summons. Because when we take that first step, God promises. The end of the chapter, in verses 24 and on, therefore says God, the God of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, uh, I will ease me of my adversaries and avenge me of my enemies. I will turn my hand upon you and purge away your dross as with lie and will take away all your alloy. And I will restore your judges as the first and your counselors as at the beginning. Afterward, you will be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion will be redeemed with justice and her penitent with righteousness. As for the wicked, the destruction of the transgressors and the sinners will be together, and they that forsake God will be consumed. A description of utter destruction for those who refuse to heed the prophet's words. But there is the promise. The promise is, again, Zion will be redeemed with justice. And David returns her repenting with righteousness. Stern words of rebuke. Great words of remedy. And not just for the generation to which the prophet addressed them, but definitely to us. Because we learned, going back to Deuteronomy chapter 32, how significant our actions are, because history is significant, and what we do will have historic significance. Because we know that, because we see everything that's happening within the context of that historic development, because of that whole picture, we appreciate the remedy must express itself in what we do, how we cleanse ourselves of our iniquities, not by covering them up, not by sweeping them under the rug, not by coming into the holy temple and praying a lot and speaking to everyone about how religious we are and how devoted we are to God. If you're devoted to God, you will be devoted to each and every one of his creations. Your fellow human being will fight for them. You will relieve them of their suffering. You will do your utmost to alleviate their oppression. You will truly 
make yourself into a human being as a means to becoming a godly being beyond that. May we all integrate the words of the Prophet into our lives and merit God's blessings. God bless you.